There it is. It's seven o'clock. Welcome. My name is Celine and I am a program specialist here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And we are so excited to bring you the sci-fi series tonight. Um, Dr. Paterio can talk about more about the history of the sci-fi series, but as someone who's new to the museum and new to the series, I'm very grateful to be a part of it. And I'm very happy to have all of you here with us. Without further introduction, I will uh, further ado, there you go. I'll introduce Dr. Paterio to say a little bit more about who he is and what he does. Uh, thanks, Celine. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to tonight in our second week of this year's sci-fi series. Uh, we're so happy to be able to bring you something this year. Uh, took a while to get us here, but we're really happy about it. Um, so so um, I'm Dr. Vincent Baturo from MSU Denver. I teach film and media studies, a professor of film and media studies at MSU Denver. And this is our 10th year of the science fiction film series. Uh, we started 10 years ago. I think our first night was, I think it was at the Film Center, our first night 10 years ago. And uh, I think that first screening was 2001 Space Odyssey on film, actually. It was on 35 millimeter. I remember that night well because it was so, so beautiful, so beautiful on film there. And um, we weren't sure how the series was going to go. We really had no idea. Um, there was a partnership between the Museum of Nature and Science, the Denver Film Society, MSU Denver. And um, so we, we sort of put this together, you know, pretty quickly a few months before and started it off and 10 years later, here we are. And uh, it's been one of the more successful series um, that, you know, we've done in partnership with the uh, Film Society and the great partnership of the museum. So um, I'll introduce my colleague, um, Jeff Stevenson in, in, in a minute here. Um, say, say hello, say hello, Jeff. Um, we, we've hi. I think um, Jeff, you could probably talk about how many times you've done the series. I know we've done it going way, way back. I start to remember now. You know, ten years, six times each year. So after sixty shows, I'm not quite sure exactly what we did, um, but I know we've done some really fun ones together. Um, so um, tonight we're going to talk about um, the original Godzilla, Gojira, the Japanese film from 1954. And um, hopefully you saw it, you know, recently before this talk. Um, not just, you know, when you're when you're a kid growing up, like I did, and tried to watch it like every Saturday morning. I think it was like on like 10 a.m. every Saturday morning. My friends were watching Super Friends, the cartoons, and I was watching Godzilla. You know, this movie. Um, I know many of you said this is one. Of, this is your favorite monster movie. It's one of my favorite monster movies, um, along with King Kong for sure. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. And I think Jeff will talk about that. Um, I, th I was thinking though of some other kind of maybe monster movies a little on the edge. And I was thinking of Alien. And I think we can kind of classify that as a monster movie as well. And um, that's one of the films we, we cover in one of my sci-fi classes and it's always a favorite and it's always a great, great film. Uh, before I go too far though, I just do want to talk about our book project. Um, Celine put, a slide up there before and there's also a link in the chat if you want to um, take a look at the page for our book the book is basically 10 years worth of doing this series it's 10 chapters one chapter on each film so 10 films and uh, i co-write the chapter with one of my colleagues from the museum um, i think dr kachun Yu, who's uh, going to be with us next week he wrote three chapters Dr. Nicole Garno, she wrote three chapters. Uh, Jeff wrote one of the chapters on King Kong. He can talk more about that. Um, and then there's a few other chapters with uh, Dr. Steve Lee, uh, Dr. Joe Sertich. And um, so then some of my colleagues from MSU Denver chipped in a couple of pieces here and there. Um, the, we're not sure of the release date on the book yet. I was told later this fall or, or winter, uh, but you can pre-order it from that link. All author proceeds, anything that comes to us, will be donated to the Food Bank of the Rockies. So if you wanna pre-sale the book, pre-buy the book, next year when we're doing this in person again, we are going to have book signings. So please hang on to the book. If you do buy it sooner than next summer and bring it next year, we're gonna have a big party next year. We're gonna have a lot of parties next year, I'm pretty sure. But for this series, we're gonna have a big party, absolutely. So um, as Celine said, put your questions in the chat as we go along. I'm going to give a little introduction to the film, and Jeff's going to talk a little bit about it, and then we'll get to your questions. Okay, um, so let's go back. The film was released in 1955, and um, 
we have to kind of go back to World War One to tell, or I'm sorry, World War Two to tell this um, whole story, because it really starts at the end of World War Two, off the coast of Japan. There's a group of islands called the Marshall Islands. Uh, the United States kind of, uh, you know, bombed the the islands during the war, um, took over the islands, and kind of kept hold of the islands after the war. And what they used the islands for was um, atomic bomb testing. They were testing H-bombs out there in the Pacific off the coast of the islands. Now, the Japanese government told the fishermen just don't go to this particular area. They didn't tell the fishermen why. They just said, don't go to this area. By the way, this is all, this is true story. This is history now. I didn't even get to the movie yet. So what I'm saying, what I'm talking about is actually true. So the Japanese government told them, don't go to this area. They didn't tell anybody why. Well, this um, fishing boat 1954 decided, well, hey, nobody's going out there. There must be tons of fish. Let's go out there. We'll sneak out there at night. And, you know, I'm sure we're going to get tons of, of fish. So, so they went out there. They're fishing. They you know, think they're doing well. And all of a sudden, they see a bright light off in the distance. Uh, they were so far away, they didn't hear the thunder for several minutes. And then, of course, the cloud comes in. The radiation comes in. Well, they didn't know exactly what hit them at that point, but they were, knew it wasn't good. So you know, they headed back to shore. And sure enough, um, they started developing radiation poisoning. And, and just, uh, I think it was just a few weeks before Gojira, the movie, came out, is when the first person from the ship actually died from that radiation poisoning. And this is 1955. This is not Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This is 1955 when they're doing this testing there. Um, so, of course, there was, you know, there's an uproar amongst the Japanese people uh, about what was going on. They wanted transparency, etc. And so that became the basis for the film. And the film kind of came together uh, pretty quickly, you know, once the, direct, the director Ishiro Honda found out about this incident. And so that's what you really see in the movie. In the beginning of the film, you see that boat that's out there, Lucky Dragon 5 was the name of the boat. You see the boat out there, um, you see everyone start to get infected. What's so great about this film, what I love so much about this film, is it's not a westernized monster movie. We don't see the monster in the first five minutes um, and then know that the monster's looming you know, the whole time. We don't see the monster till basically halfway through. We just get a peek of the monster and then he really comes in for the last third of the movie is when it really becomes the monster movie. Throughout the, um, throughout the film, what we really get is we get this wonderful humanistic story that focuses on the people, the effects of what is going on on the people at this particular time, 1954, 1955. But it also brings up those memories and images of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, but also even just the fire bombings, carpet bombings that the US was doing over Japan during World War II. So when you see those images of, uh, you know, when, when Godzilla's coming to Tokyo and wreaking havoc there, and you see people fleeing the city, or you, people see, you see people flooded, flooding the hospitals, or, you know, or burning alive, that, that is all evoking images that were still fresh in the minds of the Japanese people from World War II. Um, so it's, it's this, you know, monster movie on the one hand, uh, but it's also this really dense humanistic story with a lot of political undertones to it. Um, so, so I want to, we can talk about any, any of that stuff. I can talk about the, the animation in the film, uh, the rubber suits, of course, but also the animation, the miniatures, which was really, a lot of it was influenced by King Kong, um, which was some almost 15 years old or 13 years earlier. Um, but that King Kong, the original American King Kong, was the, you know, was the seminal uh, film for stop motion animation special effects, especially when it comes to monster movies, but really special effects of any kind. Um, so, so we can talk about those things if you want. We can talk about the politics. We can talk about the history. We can talk about the rubber suits that, you know, didn't work at first and, you know, all those kinds of crazy things. Um, I do want to talk about the Americanized version. I saw that Nick posted something about no Raymond Burr. Um, so, so the American version that came out was, um, let me see here, 1956, you know, soon after, of course, 
the Americans saw this movie and said, we have to remake it, but we have to do it way, way worse in America. Um, and so that's what the Americans did. They cut it all up. They took out footage. They added uh, uh, this reporter who, who was reporting on the scene, an American reporter played by Raymond Burr. And uh, that's what Nick was talking about when he said, no Raymond Burr. It's sort of this, for those, those of you of a certain age, you grew up in the 70s in the United States, it's kind of the only version of this we saw. Um, and then when we finally saw this real original Japanese version, and we felt so cheated, like we wanted all those hours back that we spent on Saturday morning. We could have been watching Super Friends um, and, and, or, or the, the actual you know, real version of the film. Uh, so we can talk about the remake if you want as, as well. And then of course it spawned, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of sequels, thousands of sequels. And um, <laughs> I don't really want to get into all that because we don't have time. In fact, I can't remember all that. I do remember Godzilla versus King Kong at one point. That's about it. Uh, but anyway, I'd like to um, uh, invite my colleague now, um, Jeff Stevenson, to join us. And Jeff, why don't you just um, sort of um, describe yourself, what you do at the museum, and then talk a little bit about the film. Thank you all. Uh, my name is Jeff Stevenson. I'm the collections manager for the zoology collections at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Uh, it's my privilege uh, to take care of over a million uh, close to a million two hundred thousand uh, specimens of invertebrate and vertebrate creatures. Um, nothing quite like King Kong, like nothing quite like Godzilla in the collections, but we do have reptiles and we have mammals and birds and insects and spiders and um, When I watch science fiction monster movies, I, I come at them from a naturalist perspective. For me, um, that's the kind of science fiction I really like is uh, science fiction that's based on biology. Um, to answer the question, what's my favorite monster movie is this about the same as asking me what's my favorite specimen at the museum. And my usual answer is I will tell you something, but 15 seconds later, I'm going to give you another answer because that's so varied and uh, wonderfully, life is wonderfully surprising. And the imagination of sci-fi writers who write about living organisms is also equally varied and surprising. I guess the, the, one vicious monster that I would uh, put right up there would be Tribble from Star Trek, the invasive species that could destroy whole uh, planets worth of grain. And cute as, cute as buttons, but watch out for them. Uh, I did put together a few slides um, for this movie. This is, this is by far and away my favorite of all the Godzilla movies. Um, and if I do this right, I'm supposed to be able to share, ah, um, something. Um, there it is, I think. Okay, can you still hear me? Okay. <laughs> so this is from the movie. Um, this is our really interesting creature. And I guess for a naturalist, the, the question is, what is this creature? What, where does it belong in uh, the family tree of life on earth? Or uh, is it a dinosaur or is it something else? Um, and uh, growing up, I grew up, in, I was born in the 50s and grew up in the 50s and 60s. And growing up at that time, there was a vision of dinosaurs, which was um, this up here, old, uh, clunky, um, slow, 
fat, tail dragging, doomed to extinction because of that. And they became extinct because they were old, flat, fat, slow, clunky, tail dragging, moronic creatures. When I started studying um, in the 80s and 90s, studying dinosaurs more seriously, actually that was during a revolution in the thinking on dinosaurs. And dinosaurs were, uh, by a lot of different people, a lot of different lines of evidence, um, made skinnier, made faster, made more dynamic. The tails were not dragging. These animals ruled the earth and they weren't doomed to extinction because they were slow, moronic, tail dragging things, but they were, uh, in other words, they weren't doomed to extinction for any fault inherent in their own makeup. But science is interesting. Science is a way of thinking that um, when we, one of, the, one of the biggest things in science is um, we have to be honest. We have to, when we find out something new based on new facts, and we have to change what we say. And so the old picture of the very fast, dynamic, skinny T-Rex is now changing, at least for the grown-up T-Rexes. This thing over here, it's got these bones in the bottom. Those are called gastralia, they're stomach bones. And they have found some um, uh, sediment with these bones, with the skeletons inside that they can do CAT scans and actually look inside using CAT scan imagery. Uh, and they're really kind of chubby. They're the, that is the adult full grown T-Rexes are really fat. Um, really, really roly poly. The tails don't drag. Their tails are still up. They're still able to walk pretty fast. They don't run around like gazelles. The, the young T-Rexes, the other theropod, the meat eating dinosaurs, they're pretty fast. They're, they can still run you down. Uh, T-Rex could walk you down. So, but if you notice, T-Rex has a long snout and very sharp teeth. Not all T-Rexes have that. And this T-Rex is interesting. Um, I don't remember who modeled this T-Rex, but it's got three fingers, by the way, which we know is not accurate. But look at the size of the legs. Now, in a T-Rex that's still chubby, it's got well-muscled legs, but they're not chubby legs. So maybe we need to look somewhere else. In the world of lizards, these are all in the monitor lizard family, the varanid lizards. Uh, there are water monitors and Nile monitors and savanna monitors. The, the uh, monitor that a lot of people know is the Komodo dragon, which is the really big, biggest lizard right now. Uh, really big monitor lizard, um, something you don't want to get bit by. This is a critter from Australia. It's called the goanna. They're also cousins of the monitors, but they have really long necks and really long muzzles. When you see a really long muzzle like this, that's indicating this is an animal that's going to eat meat. It's a carnivore. Um, now, one of the later Godzilla movies, they have it eating fish. Um, I think that's a Matthew Broderick one. Um, and actually fish eaters have even narrower, longer muzzles. Think gharials and other creatures like that. Um, so anyway, for these reasons, I don't think these are good affinities for Gojira Let's take a look at something else. These are iguanas. Iguanas are very interesting uh, new world uh, creatures. They're found in Central South America and then on in Caribbean islands, uh, into the Gulf Coast and in, uh, on, in the Pacific on islands there. They have a short snout. By the way, they have five fingers. And careful examination of Gojira when, when it actually shows its hands, it's got five fingers. Just 
no, no dinosaurs had five fingers. But anyway, let's go on. Ah, the other cool thing about adaptations that these guys have done is when they got to the Galapagos, iguanas diversified into this group of uh, closely related animals on the several islands of the Galapagos, and they're called um, marine iguanas. And they are ocean amphibious. They're in the water and out of the water. They're eating in the water. They're eating the seaweed. By the way, that is a Galapagos fur seal. Um, and it is underwater. And this lizard is underwater. They're one of the only lizards that actually swim under the water. They hook on with sharp claws and chow down. If they were trying to eat the seaweed with long muzzles, it would be hard to do. So they have these short muzzles that are adapted to scraping the seaweed off the rocks and they get chunky. Nice chunk there. Still uh, pretty skinny legs. And they got this nice little frill. So this one's got a lot of interesting affinities with um, our critter. I like this one. This is a, a marine iguana. You can see there are five fingers, um, nice frill. And well, I can't see uh, a heat ray, or not a heat ray, some kind of hot breath, whatever Gojira has um, coming out from this animal. They do actually exude salt because being in the ocean, eating all that seaweed, they get a lot of excess salt in their system. They got to expel it because it's not good for you. Uh, to have that much salt. So they actually uh, snort out streams of salt from their nostrils. Um, so maybe, maybe he's just a uh, mutated. There is some radiation there, right? It's a, there's a funny story. Actually, we got uh, um, offered a giant clam that was recovered by an expedition to Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands, as Vincent was talking about. This was one year after the first tests, which were A-bomb tests. They, they did the A-bomb tests, I believe, in uh, 1946 on Bikini. Um, and uh, of course, my curator said, yes, we want that. And we said, OK, well, we'll go get it. And then I got a Geiger counter and checked it out right away because I didn't want to have something in my collection that was going to um, change things. <laughs> uh, uh, and then later on, Bikini became uninhabitable uh, due to uh, what Vincent was talking about. But, um, and the giant clams weren't made giant by the radiation. The, uh, the, uh, it was the H-bomb tests in the 50s that, that um, Actually, the planned uh, yield, I guess is what they call it, for H-bombs was uh, smaller than what they actually got. And it was much bigger than they got. And they um, basically have rendered bikini uninhabitable for the future. Um, oh, so getting back to Gojira, um, there is something interesting about this creature. It, and, and it seems to be different sizes. Uh, the, the, the first one, the, the first image that I showed, he's a, a little over 200 feet. This is a, this one, he's, that's about 85-ish feet. Um, and this one, well, I, I don't know what the average height of uh, people in Japan is or was, but let's say he's a little over five and a half feet tall. Uh, if you take the people out and there's just that bridge, then he's probably, what, 150 feet tall. Um, I have a little tiny Gojira on one of my, uh, it's this big. So anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a very mutable, changeable thing. Uh, this is interesting too. I'm not so sure that that's just a baggy rubber suit as a an actual representation of what you would need to carry the weight if you were this big and walking around. Creatures, <clears throat> there have been really big creatures. Um, the, the biggest creatures 
<clears throat> on Earth so far, uh, at least the ones that are living now are whales. And then there have been some really enormous size swimming reptiles. One's a sw swimming um, relative of those monitor lizards and a, another one's a swimming relative of the plesiosaurs. Uh, gigantic, huge, humongous creatures that would have a hard time on dry land. And so, oh yeah, T-Rex, what, T-Rex, maybe five tons. Um, how many elephants are we going to, not elephants, that's too small. How many blue whales are we going to get in this? What's the blue whale equivalent? Six blue whales? It was a 200 feet, maybe eight blue whales. I did the math somewhere. Eight blue whales. It's enormous. Hey, excuse me, Jeff, I'd like to ask you a question. Are you sure. saying that Godzilla is not naturally occurring? This is not a naturally occurring uh, monster in nature? Is that what you're saying to us? Well, I was just trying to figure its uh, affinities. <laughs> I, and, and something about its uh, biomechanics, uh, just to move the what if uh, it's over 200 feet tall it may be uh two million pounds if it's the same weight as a whale uh, same same mass anyway uh, by the way there you can see the five fingers so is this something that was produced by the radiation is there's some hypotheses that we could explore here that um maybe something like a, a very, very, very lost marine iguana was um, up in the Marshall, down in the Marshall Islands and um, down, up. No, that would be up. Anyway, and uh, got really uh, irradiated. But most of the time when you irradiate living animals, the results aren't good. Most of the time. Anyway, I think it's fun. And I think I should exit from that. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. I do want to, uh, one thing though, I want to know how that works where you get faster and skinnier um, because I, I, I'm, I want that to happen. But um, Celine, do you have, um, do you have some you questions age. for us? Sorry, was that Jeff? You, you get the opposite, slower and not skinnier as you age. Oh, okay. I see. All right, I'm going to stay away from that. Celine, do you have a question for us from the chat room? I do, and I'll take this opportunity to let everybody know uh, to keep sending us your questions. Um, you might not be able to see them, but we can see them on our end, and I'm keeping track of themes and specific questions that you might have. Um, it can be for both uh, Dr. Paturo and Jeff or for um, and either one of them. But with uh, the idea of what kind of creature he is, so, uh, Jeff, I noticed you focused a lot on the, the lizard-like um, characteristics that Godzilla had. Are there any other animals that you could see in there? Somebody in the comments um, asked if you could see the whale in there or the gorilla in there or any other inspiration from creatures um, that they could have taken. And Dr. Patera, if you know more about what inspired uh, Gojira, please chime in. Oh, personally, oh, you want to go first, Vincent? Okay. Uh, personally, I see Homo sapiens in there. Literally. Rather than <laughs> rather than gorilla. Oh, it does have flat feet, which is not a dinosaur trait. Uh, not really a gorilla trait either. What kind of trait is that, or what creature? Oh, it's a lizard trait. Jeff, would you also give us a just a, a, a quick little summary of um, King Kong, of the you know the gorilla from King Kong, and, and kind of give us a sense of what your piece of the chapter is about? Maybe just really quickly. I don't want to veer off too much from Gojira, but but King Kong is you know the the grandfather father of all monster movies and inspired Ishiro Honda, inspired this whole generation. Um, how accurate was the gorilla in, or, you know, in King Kong? How does that work? I love the gorilla in King Kong. It's, uh, 
something like 30, 35 feet tall or something like that. And it's, uh, it's not inconceivable. It would work. Um, you could actually make a skeleton of something that big work. Uh, I noticed that he doesn't climb trees. Actually, there's one scene in, in uh, King Kong where he comes up to a vine and he grabs the vine and he just yanks it off. It's like all the other movies you see swinging through. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, it, I find it really, really very believable that King Kong from a naturalist point of view. And I, and I think the... Um... Yeah, I think the idea with the, the King Kong is that it was meant to be sort of more more believable and scary and like this could happen. We, we've talked about this before. There's a whole, you know, sort of racial issue there too, you know, underlying racial issue with King Kong. Here, it's it's very much allegory. You know, the, the monster is metaphor, you know, for radiation. And you, you can see that in a lot of different ways. It's, you know, I'm sorry to go off here, Celine, but I, I think some, some people might find this interesting is that there's so many times in the movie when death is delayed. Um, you know, so the radio operator doesn't die right away, but he dies, you know, in another time, like soon, soon after. Um, you, you know, when, when, when Godzilla is coming into the city, it's slow, right? Um, and you hear the, you know, you hear the great sound effects of his pounding feet or whatever they're called, his pounding legs you know, which is supposed to be the, the sounds of bombs, right, hitting. And he comes in slowly, and that slowness speaks to that time period where you're exposed to the radiation, but you don't really die later on, right? And it's that awful sort of period, right? And so that, that dread that the Japanese felt, you know, after the bombs, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and then they hear about, Oh my gosh, the government's been lying to us, and there's bombs right up right off our coast now. All of a sudden they feel that dread again. And so there was this immense distrust, you know, towards that government at the time, 1955. The, you know, the, the US had left a couple of years earlier. The Marshall Plan was over. Japanese had kind of had their own, you know, government installed. And now you have this whole issue comes out, and the Japanese became immediately distrustful of their own government is a great point, Dr. Baturo, and um, a few folks in the, um, in the chat are asking a very, very similar question. Um, given how recent uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were, given how American troops were still occupying Japan at this point, um, this was a very political film. Was there any one backlash um, in terms of just how outright political it was? Um, or any like discussion happening um, in Japan surrounding this? So, um, so, so again, the, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki was about 10 years earlier, nine years earlier, I guess, when this film was made. Um, and the U.S. wasn't occupying Japan at this time when the film came out. They had left a few years earlier. The Marshall Plan was intact um, in 1940, or I'm sorry, 1952, three, I think is when they left. Um, you know, they're still influencing Japanese government at that time. So, yeah, there was distrust towards the Americans. But um, the Japanese people were really distrustful of their own government at this point. They didn't know, you know, what to believe from them. Now, when the Japanese saw the film, they immediately recognized the metaphor, the allegory at work. They understood exactly what the film was talking about. Um, and, you know, and the film really had this, you know, humanist, pacifist underlying sentiment to it. America is a whole, whole different story because we never got to see this film right away, right? Americans, we got to see the horrible Raymond Burr, Burr version and it was such a mess, we didn't really understand. We didn't get that allegory. It took all that out. It kind of elevated the love story and the monster and the destruction. Um, so a lot of that political undertone was, was, was taken out and, and American audiences didn't, didn't see any of that. But the Japanese saw it and the Japanese, you know, um, we're very, very much engaged, you know, in, in that whole discussion. Let me add too quickly that and if, I'm sure some of you in the chat and some of you out there watching have been to Japan. And if you've been to Hiroshima, it's a wonderful city. It's a beautiful city. It's a um, peaceful city. The museum, the, the, the Peace Park takes up, you know, a huge portion of the downtown where the bombs, where the bomb actually dropped. 
Um, there's just a great peaceful vibe. And it was really in the 50s, the, the sort of center of anti-nuclear pacifist sentiment in the world, in that city. And uh, let me just recommend another movie if you really like sort of French art cinema, check out Hiroshima Mon Amour. It's, it's called Hiroshima Mon Amour. You could uh, check that out. That was from later on, 1959. And that um, sort of, talks a little bit about that whole peace movement in Hiroshima at that point. I just wrote that down. And also a good note, if you all see me with a pen that you might not be able to see with my green screen looking down, it's because I'm keeping track of everybody's questions. Um, but that does bring a really great question. Um, and I'd actually like to start with Jeff for this question. Um, throughout the film, you see a doctor who's really, really interested in studying um, this creature. They want to know more about him um, and they're trying to balance the, the idea of safety and just the well-being of, of the citizens at that point with this idea of getting to know what what made this monster, how, how is he resistant to radiation, like what can we do? Um, you mentioned earlier that you actually said no to a piece for your collection based on the possibility of it, uh, basically the cost outweighed because um, it could damage other collections. Could you talk about your perspective and what you think, uh, what would you have done? What, what is the ethical thing to have done in that instance from the scientist's perspective? Hmm. Uh, is my, is my uh, mic working? Okay, uh, well, uh, I would, I uh, personally, I would really rather study Gojira in the wild. Um, I would really rather have the beasts of Jurassic Park available for study, not for show. Um, I would uh, not to not try to take King Kong off his island. Um, for me, I, I, every bit of nature is uh interconnected you take one thing away and it's going to wreck the balance now if oh, well, there's a story about uh there's a fellow who um was responsible for the death of the last grizzly bear in colorado and uh he was hunting he wasn't hunting grizzlies he was hunting elk uh but by chance a grizzly managed to run down the trail, knock him over, knock the hunting bow out of his hand, ate part of his leg, mauled his arm, and he was able to grab one of the arrows and stab the creature and it died. Um, some people were going to charge him with a crime for killing an endangered animal, but I do think you have a point where if that thing is trying to eat you, you might have a point. Um, self-defense in that case if you know versus being eaten i guess the thing to do is to not tick godzilla off but i would I rather really class. rather study it <laughs> well put me in the category of if that thing's coming at me breathing you know radiation i'm taking it out any way i can going down with that in mind, Dr. Paturo, um, what do you, what was your reading of the doctor that wanted to study it? What was he supposed to represent anything? Um, is there anything that, like, tell us more about the character. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a couple different things going on there. And, and you know, you know, one of the, um, one of the facets of it is, it's, it's sort of telling the, you know, the Manhattan Project, the Albert Einstein story where Einstein, you know, was, you know, oh my gosh, look what, you know, look, look what I've brought on, right? I, I brought this, you know, this science into the world and then, you know, this, this happens, right? So, you know, what do you do at that point? Do you try to kill it um, or do you try to keep it, try to use it, use it for good, right? So there's that struggle between science and, and humanism uh, in the film. And I, I don't think there's any good answer to it. I think the film that the, I know Ishiro Honda, the director, what he felt about it, you know, he wanted to do away with the bombs. He was a um, he was in the Japanese army, uh, 
he, you know, during World War II, he was a prisoner. During World War II, he saw the atrocities um, of Nagasaki and um, Hiroshima. Um, and so he, uh, he wanted to stop, stop the whole thing. And, and I think there's some of that, that sort of regret uh, in the film from the scientists. Look at what we've wrought. Absolutely. And in that same vein, do you think that uh, that's part of the reason that for any death in the film, and this was a question from the chat um, from Becca, for any death in the film, we do get to know, the, even back to that slow death um, theme that you were talking about, we get to know the person before they die. We know who's about to die. We get to know them as a person. Um, do you think that that's why the director did that? It's to, to tell that humanization story? Oh, yeah, I definitely think it's meant to um, personalize it for us because the, um, you know, the, the, the Japanese, their, their neighbors died, their families died, people they knew died, were, you know, were killed in, you know, in bombings, and not just Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but the bombings all over, you know, the country. So we get a lot of shots of scenes of people. And then later on, we come back to them. And I think this is what the person's talking about. We, we see them and then later on, we come back to them and then they die, right? And, and the director wants us to get to know them, right? And then when they die, it's that much more personal and it's tougher for us. And that's what the Japanese went through. Um, he wanted to make it clear, Hiroshima, um, um, Ishiro Honda wanted to make it clear you know, that these, there were real people that died and people knew those people who died and those deaths were real. And, um, you know, I'm not gonna get too far off into, you know, how this relates to our current world, but you don't have to go too far, right? To understand that there's real people dying out there today and those people have families and they were known and they touched a lot of people's lives. So the film doesn't try to whitewash all that. It's not just, faceless, nameless people that die as, as in some monster movies, as real people who we get to know and who real people knew. Is that a theme that we see continued um, in monster movies or science fiction? Um, or do you think that was unique to a fairly political movie? Um, there's no easy answer to that. I think we see that in some movies, but it's it's much more powerful in this film because of the real life antecedents. Because it just happened eight years earlier, nine years earlier, you know, there. And, you know, the Japanese watching this, most of them, if not all of them, probably had relatives, friends, people they knew who died. Um, so it was much more personal and powerful, you know, for them. You know, when we watch a movie like Alien, we know the people on the ship are gonna die, you know, from the beginning of it. Um, they're not our friends. And it's also, you know, it's placed in a faraway future. We talked a little bit about this last week. It's placed in a faraway future so that there's this distance. And so it depersonalizes all that sort of death and dying for us. A film like this or a film like Children of Men that makes it look like our world today where we can't look away, um, it's much harder to see, much harder to take, but it's also more urgent. We have to do something about this issue. Japanese wanted to get rid of the, the, the bombings and the tests, wanted to get rid of all the radiation in that period. Um, so I think it's, it's, it started here, probably happened in a few other movies, but it was much more powerful and much more urgent in this film. Somebody in the, in the chat said that uh, a lot of the lessons that we see could still be applied today if you substitute um, radiation for COVID-19, you could have a very similar story. And I think that's a a great point and really telling of a movie that continues to be powerful well past, uh, what, 60, 70 years after it was released. Um, I want to go back a little more to the science of everything. Um, and so this direction, uh, this question is directed to Jeff. Jeff, um, we were talking about uh, that, that doctor that was um, interested in studying uh, Gojira. Um, when he was describing dinosaurs, he had a different timeline for when the Jurassic period was. Um, can you go a little bit more into, like, was that just what the thinking at the time was? Have we learned a lot in 70 years? Um, or is that cinematic magic? Uh, back in the 1950s, uh, people were debating how old the Earth was. They were trying to fit life on Earth into those, uh, into that 
time frame. And it, it was only hundreds of millions of years, and um, we didn't have good dates for a lot of the periods of time. Um, I actually have a, a geologic time scale from 1960, and uh, um, it it has it's been revised. Um, radiometric dating really didn't uh, come into play until the late 50s, um, and in general. Uh, dating rocks didn't come into play. I mean, interestingly enough, it's all related to the atomic age too. So the techniques are um, wrapped up with that. Um, that is actually how you date ancient rocks um, or organic remains if you're using carbon-14. It's all about radiation uh, or the, what changes when unstable isotopes change to other isotopes so that you can count them. But um, yeah, it, lectures from, if they, if they had uh, video recordings of lectures from the 1950s, um, we might think they were, oh, oh, what's a good word? Quaint, not quaint, um, quaint. <laughs> Well, that's fascinating. And somebody in the chat just pointed out that, uh, well, yes, that uh, we've learned a lot more in terms of what we know for science. And also, hello to Dr. Patero's cat. Um, but um, what's interesting about the film is, in spite of that, it's still multi, like multi generational. It's still something that um, was enjoyed in the 1950s for very poignant reasons. It was enjoyed in the 70s when it that version came to us um, and continues to be enjoyed. Uh, Dr. Patero, do you have any idea why um, it is so multi-generational? Why it's a film that has withstood the test of time? Oh yeah, I think for many reasons. And some of the reasons we talked about, I don't you know, go over all those things, the powerful emotion, the humanity, the urgent feeling of it, the, the fact that we get to know people before they're slaughtered, all those things you know, are timeless. Um, but, but let's not forget about the, um, we're talking a lot about theme and, and, and that's in history. Let's not forget about the actual filming itself, the cinematic aspects. The cinematography was wonderful. The, the shots of the faces, the people, the masses of running away and, you know, the, the deep focus cinematography of some of that wonderful black and white, you know, the, those pictures. Um, the sound, the sound is wonderful in the film. The people shrieking. You know, the, as I talked about, you know, Godzilla pounding as he's walking, um, the, the, um, the, the sound effect of Godzilla, you know, itself is, you know, absolutely famous and, and continues on. So the actual film itself is just a really good film. Sometimes we get lost in the monster stuff and the destruction and, and then we get off in the history. We talk about all those things. But it's actually a really, really well done film in so many ways. And there's, there's everything in there. There's monsters, there's fire, destruction, and there's a love story too. Um, you know, so it, it has so many different things that make it, that make it timeless. Um, but if, if, you point to, if you want to point to one thing, to over, over simplify it, it's the emotion of the film. The emotion in the film and the emotion that the film evokes. Absolutely. And you uh, touched on something that we've actually seen a few different times in the chat. Can you talk a little bit more about the music? Uh, there's different music when Gojira shows up on screen. Um, there's different themes. Just tell us a little bit more about that. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, it, it's almost classic Hollywood cinema in that respect, where the music really uh, parallels the action. Um, you know, so when the lovers are on their screen, we get a very certain type of music. When, um, you know, there's periods of silence you know, when they're looking out over the sea to, to, to you know, to, or when Godzilla peeks over the ridge, you know, there's periods of silence and tension. Um, and then there's, you know, the stirring, um, you know, marching music almost during, during the, you know, attack on Tokyo. Um, so in that respect, it's, it's very much classic cinema, you know, that, that Hollywood had been doing for a long time in the music, um, although they do it much better <laughs> um, in, in this film than most of, most of, classic Hollywood cinema is not a pejorative term. It doesn't mean that's all bad. 
Um, there's a lot of good things from classic Hollywood cinema, like the use of music and how it evokes passion and emotion as well. There's a term for that in, in film. We call that melos, M-E-L-O-S. Melos is the emotional effect of the music. And that's again, adds to that whole emotional effect I was talking about before. That is fascinating. Um, we do have about 10 minutes left. Uh, so we'll keep answering uh, questions from the audience. Um, I did want to uh, direct this question to Jeff first. Um, can we talk a little bit about, we said there was about a 13 year gap um, between King Kong and Gojira. Can you talk about some of the overlap, some of the differences, um, and some things that were maybe borrowed or inspired from, or done better, um, that, that Gojira did that was inspired from King Kong? Um, <laughs> I think it was actually a 23 year gap. Um, King Kong's 32. Wow. Yeah, um, go ahead. And, we, and Jeff, you talked about earlier uh, some of the similar or the differences were that King Kong was a lot more believable. Um, just from a just from a, a nerdy naturalist point of view, in that sense, uh, they're both really big and uh, both really scary. Um, King Kong actually puts people in his mouth and chews them and eats them. Um, and uh, attacks a city. Uh, so in, in that sense, uh, Godzilla is really being the monster. Only the city is Tokyo. Um, although he does need algae though, I would really like to see Godzilla eating algae. I think he just has a little snack pack of algae. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, no, that's absolutely true. And it, wow, 23 years is quite a gap. Um, since, Celine, uh, I mentioned, sorry, yeah, Celine, can I ahead. mention one thing about King Kong? Um, I know I mentioned the book a few times, but the King Kong chapter is really, really fun. Um, there's actually three parts to that chapter. Is, um, the, the part I do with the analysis of the film, there's Jeff's part, which is really fascinating about, about the, you know, the gorilla. Um, and then there's the third part to that chapter, and I know a lot of you I see in the chat talking about music. The third part to the chapter in the book on King Kong is from a colleague of mine, um, Dr. Roger Green, who's also a musician um, and studies film as well. Um, he analyzes the music in King Kong, the score of King Kong. So if you're interested in music and film music, it's again the you know the, the the book will be coming out sometime. We're not sure when, but it's a really great chapter and it really goes into depth in those areas. That is a great reminder, and I'll just uh, throw in a little plug that all author proceeds will be donated to the Food Bank of the Rockies. So it's a good way to expand your film, science, uh, and all of that knowledge while also for a good cause. Um, well, like I said, 23 years is quite a bit of gap. Um, since then, uh, Godzilla has kind of taken a life of his own, um, and we've had various iterations of that. Um, I'd love to hear both from the scientific perspective um, and just the cinematic perspective. What's different? What has changed? What do we wish we could, we could have kept? Um, so again, I'll direct that question to Jeff first to see if there's any, has, do we know anything else? Um, have you seen any of the recent ones and it, are they more scientifically accurate? No. Uh, it's gotten, uh, I don't know, it's, it's kind of, you dread the sequel because of uh, the first, there's very, very few movies where the sequel is better than the first one. There's a few, but, um, and there might be a couple of gems uh, in the whole wad of Godzilla movies. The, uh, no, <laughs> it hasn't gotten any better. Uh, it's gotten, uh, oh, I don't know. It, it's Americanized. I mean, even even the most recent ones, uh, uh, controlling monsters with sonic something. Um, 
and then all of the monsters. It's like it's like monster movies meets the Avengers when they have all the monsters are uh, are called together by King Kong and not King Kong, uh, uh, Godzilla. Um, really? Sorry. <laughs> no, I appreciate the honesty. I think there are some people in the chat that absolutely agree with you. Dr. Patero, uh, your thoughts on what has changed, what should have stayed the same? <laughs> well, what, what should have happened was they never should have made another version or another Godzilla movie after this one. Um, and I, yeah, I agree with Jeff. I agree with everybody in the chat who's like, I'm not reading all of them, but I'm guessing they're saying, yes, all the other ones are just big action movies, Avengers movies. You know, as Martin Scorsese called the Avengers movies, and I know this is going to make some people mad out there, but he called them, you know, it's like a theme park. It's like going to a theme park. And, um, yeah, the Godzilla movies, the most recent iterations are definitely theme parks. Wow. Um, I, that's funny, given what other movies we've done in the sci-fi series, like Jurassic Park, where it's literally a theme park. <laughs> so great connection there. Well, it looks like we've got just about uh, four minutes left. Um, do you each want to take uh, two of those minutes and let us say, let us know your final thoughts? Um, any recommendations? We've had quite a few recommendations for what to watch next, what to read next. Uh, hint, hint. The link is the link is in the chat. Um, but uh, Jeff, um, I'll have you go first and say your goodbyes. Well. Um... I think we need to uh, sometimes think out of the box as far as monster movies. Uh, um, Andromeda Strain, uh, th those movies that had uh, sweeping infections, it's not so actually out of uh, with uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the COVID um, pandemic. Um, Viruses are pretty monstrous. Um, we, we've had like what Contagion, other movies like this. Um, sadly, they might not be so much scientific science fiction anymore, which is really, really freaking scary. That's very, very true. Thank you so much, Jeff. Dr. Patero? Yeah, I think we're going to see um, a whole bunch of pandemic movies coming down the line in the next few years for sure. Um, but, it, you know, as actually Jeff was talking about bad sequels, I immediately thought of Jaws um, because Jaws, the original, you know, was a fantastic monster movie, um, but the sequels were terrible. And, um, and, you know, just come on over to my house right now. You'll see a monster movie with my two cats right behind the, the screen, actually trying to knock down all the lighting. So if I go dark, you'll know what happened here. Um, but um, yeah, so, so, you know, like for Jaws, for example, you know, was very much an allegory for capitalism, you know, and this corporatization that was happening during the 70s. And, um, you know, Godzilla is obviously very much about all those things we talked about. So I think the great monster movies, um, really have something to say. You know, they have something more than just action where it's just been here and, you know, five minutes after you leave the theater, you forget about it. The Japanese didn't forget about Gojira for a long time. But, and it also sparked, you know, outrage in the country about, you know, what the government was doing and it stoked distrust of the government. And that's just wonderful, right? That's just social action and, um, you know, for for film to do that, there's very few films in history that have done that. Um, uh, you know, the documentary, short documentary, Night and Fog, which talked about the Holocaust, which you know showed the images to the world for the first time when there were Holocaust deniers; they couldn't deny it anymore. Um, you know, Gojira is very much along those lines. That is not just a movie; it's not just a monster movie; not just a great movie cinematically, but it also has something to say and leaves us. Um, feeling something, you know, whether it's sad, angry, or spurred to action. And that's a beautiful thing. More movies should do that. Oh, very, very true. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you so much to our very own Jeff Stevenson for uh, being the science as aspect of this, um, and for Dr. Patero for being the cinematic aspect for this. We will hopefully see you all next Wednesday for the next part of the series. Um, 
And thank you so much for Denver Film for making this happen. Again, we're so grateful that we were able to bring this to you. And thank you all for joining us. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Celine. Thank Great you. job. Thank you.